hour as Brother Sherman offered. I'm going to be speaking on the topic Strength from the Lord from the 40th chapter of Isaiah. He brought his wife, uh, Yvonne, with him. And we're grateful that she was able to come, but uh, there might be an ulterior motive also because while they have two children, they have three grandchildren. And they're going to visit some grandkids after this. <laughs> so we are glad that she came with him, though, and that he is here. He preaches for the Hampton Avenue congregation in Aiken, South Carolina. I thought it was a little bit odd, though. I, I've known... Uh, Sherman for several years and not real close but uh, knew of his love for the truth and his stand for the truth and then heard a few things from a couple of his compadres uh, in South Carolina but come the lectures uh, one of them leaves and goes over to England uh, get away from it. and then uh, the other one was here and spoke but uh, even went to lunch and ate, but uh, didn't stick around for to listen to Brother Hofford. I'm I'm starting to worry, get worried. Uh, <laughs> but we're glad that he's here. Uh, know that he will have a good lesson dealing with this topic on strength from the Lord. We bring you greetings from Aiken, Aiken, South Carolina. And because my compadres did desert me, uh, <laughs> it could possibly be a hint. <laughs> um, I appreciate my wife. She's traveling with me. And, and, and I know she's going to be My wife, by the way, is a school teacher. She's uh, legally blind. So if, if, if you... If, if you saying something to her from a distance and she's not registering, it's because she don't see it. Isn't it? She's not ignoring it. Um, my wife teaches special education. The problem is when she comes home, she thinks she's still teaching. <laughs> <laughs> We've been married 17 years, and I'll say wonderful years because I've been wondering. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that in a good way. My, my wife is the reason I'm preaching. I want you to understand that. Uh, you know, when you, you wouldn't know it, but when I got married 17 years ago, I had long hair, shoulder length hair. Um, and I would come into the church. I came into the church. Uh, I used to get upset. You know, I'm from Louisiana originally. I'm a transplanted Cajun. So sometimes I would get upset. My wife had a way of calming me down because I was trying to, be, trying to be a Christian, still trying. And she said, when I get upset, she said, now you know what the Bible says, train up a husband the way you'll have him go. So, <laughs> for about six months that worked. Then I talked to a brother, he said, well, the Bible says prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. So all I can say, I, I understand, I'm going to add to what Adam said, that woman you gave me, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm honored and I'm privileged to even be invited. Uh, I don't get many calls to preach because I went to school across town over here and they taught me one thing. They taught me to say, unsheathe the sword and let the bodies fall when they may. They taught me to attack. They didn't teach me anything about attack. But I want you to understand something. I have a love for the brotherhood. And I must say that what the brothers are doing to the brotherhood is shame. It, it's just, it, uh, I, Learn it, me, I, me as I, know, I, I don't have the best education in the world. I'm not the smartest man in the world. My wife will agree with you. But what we're doing is just, it's tantamount to just being stuck on stupid. We are tearing the Lord's church down while lifting up our name. My lesson today, and I appreciate the elders, and uh, especially, uh, and I appreciate uh, Brother Hatcher for inviting me. Um, I don't get many opportunities to speak outside of my congregation because I've been there eight years and the Lord knows we still struggle. But my title, my, 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 my title tonight, today, 
is strength from God. And friends, I want I want to at this time in my life, that's the only place I can seek strength. Because I, I, I remember what Paul said over there in, 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 in 2 Corinthians around 10, chapter 10 and verse 12, that uh, if we looking at men, and that's what we're doing, measuring ourselves by other men, we're not wise. Our standard is God's word. And so let's hold up God's word. And as a matter of fact, let, let's look and see it. Now, Isaiah is dealing with, a, he has a message to strengthen, that is to comfort God's people. And it was originally written to the Jews. But our text finds Hezekiah concerned with affairs of state and personal health and praying what I consider the most fervent prayer. And God granted his request. Isaiah warned Hezekiah that strength, that is comfort, comes from God. And strength from war and rescue from war comes again from God. I want us to take comfort in the fact that when it's all said and done, what I have to say about a subject, what you have to say about a subject, what any brother or sister have to say about a subject is not relevant. God has the final word. And this is what this is the only guide that we have. And what men, learned men, have decided to do with God's word, well, let me deal with my lesson. My first point is, take comfort. And I want you to understand, comfort and strength are synonymous. Take comfort in the coming of the Lord. A charge of comfort to strengthen God's people we find in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. We gain comfort, that is, we gain strength from God. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 say, Wherefore things that were written, whatever things that were written for four time were written for our comfort, for our let me slow it down. Wherefore things are written for time were written for our learning that we do patience and that's something like we all still need to learn and comfort. We get our patience and our comfort from God's word. In a time when you're looking around you're seeing so much going on the only comfort we can get is that God already told us these things were going to go down. So why are we surprised when they actually do? I mean take God at his word literally in First Thessalonians chapter four and verse thirteen, see, but Paul writes, say, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. But friends, we have hope, and our hope and our strength comes from God. And Matthew chapter 9, verse 22, verse 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, we find comfort in the scriptures. These scriptures tell us blatantly that our comfort can only come from God's word. Thus, the only conclusive evidence that I can offer, or anyone can offer, that there can be no comfort separate and apart from God who is the source of all strength for he created us all. In Isaiah, the outline of the rest of the book in chapters 40 through 48, he speaks comfortably and that is strengthening God's people by strengthening their faith. Warfare is accomplished, chapters 49 through 57. Sin is pardoned, chapters 58 through 66. This chapter, chapter 40 of Isaiah, is in a time realm between two morally and spiritually decadent entities while observing the shining epitome of fatherhood which Hezekiah turns out to be. Hezekiah was in a unique situation. His father, Ahab, as, as we understand, was one of the most wicked men in the history of Israel. His son, Hezekiah, was a good man. But yet Hezekiah had a son Manasseh who also was wicked. So, but that, you know what that shoots in the foot? That doctrine of hereditary depravity. Because if, if we go by that doctrine, then because the father was wicked, then that would make the son wicked. Isaiah, a prophet who is not unaccustomed to having to deal with royalty, he was contemporaneous with 
with Micah, and they both were active during the reign of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah in the south, and Pekah and Hoshea while reigning in the north. And that of that corrupt son of Manasseh who were two of the worst kings ever to rule in Judah. Manasseh, who happened to be in the same bloodline. The doctrine of hereditary depravity we've already dealt with. But I have to ask the question, how can a son as rotten as Manasseh have a father as good as Hezekiah, and how could a father as rotten as Ahaz have a son as good as Hezekiah? Which goes down and points out one thing. We all have an individual responsibility and we have an ability to form our own opinion and conclusions. We make a choice in everything we do. And that's the one thing God gave us from the very beginning. In, 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 in the garden, mankind had a choice. And because they made the wrong choice, sin entered in. We have always had choice. Choices carries consequences. After the consideration of the degeneracy of Manasseh and Ahaz, one must conclude that Isaiah, this man of God, had to have some steward influence over Hezekiah because he didn't get he didn't get it from his father. Now, in chapter 40 and verse 3, we find the voice of one preparing the people for the coming of the Lord, which is also I find New Testament reference with John the Baptist, uh, the baptizer, if you will, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, Mark chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, Luke chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, the same language, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And the wilderness any time when people do not want to heed God's message. And you'll find yourself, when you're standing on truth, when you're standing for God, you're going to always, always be standing alone. Because as many people that claim they want the truth, they don't want the truth. Because the truth points out the error in you as well as me. But the beautiful thing about the truth, the truth doesn't change. We might try to change it for our own benefit, but the truth does not change. Education is tantamount to knowing God and doing the right thing with God. The term that, that they may know in Joshua chapter 3, verse 7, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 43, 2 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 8, Psalms chapter 109 and verse 27, Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 6, we find the term that they may know. God intends for us. Everything that we need for life, health, and strength can be found in God's word. Now, the paradox, the flip side of that, and it's a passage I love to use, and I quote it often. And it's not written in your book. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. Say, but the secret things belong to God. But those things that are revealed have been revealed for us and our children, and we may learn and live in the law thereby. Friend, that passage tells me that there are some things that God never intended for us to know. And since God did not intend for us to know it, why do we spend so much time dwelling on that? which is God's property. Let us focus on that which, is, which has been revealed. And still, we fail in seeking God. Isaiah had a deep and profound faith in God. He sought that which God saw, and that is the salvation of his people. And Isaiah's mind was the awesome magnitude of God's mighty majesty. Isaiah knew that salvation of any nation was by faith in the one and true God. It has been said of Isaiah, never perhaps has there been another prophet like Isaiah who stood with his head in the clouds and his feet on solid earth with his heart in the things of eternity and with his mouth and hands in the things of time with his spirit in the internal counsel of God and his body in the very definite moment of history. It's a quote from Robinson from the book of Isaiah, page 40, page 22. 
remembrance. And that seems to be a major problem with God's people. And Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9, 9 through 11, that wise preacher said, The things that have been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It has, al it has been already of old times, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those things that shall come after. Our biggest problem is that we fail to remember what thus said the Lord. If we fail to remember, then we are, gonna, we are doomed to repeat those mistakes. There is no new thing. So, and, and, and if you came here expecting me to say anything new, then you came to the wrong place. Because there is no... And, and, and I want you to understand something, friend. We must remember. In the times of our trouble right now, the Bible has informed us that these times were coming. It informs us that there are going to be people who lead the truth. It informs us that there are going to be people for whatever reason are going to stand forth and make you think you are a bitter and idiot while they're sprouting their false humility and sprouting false doctrine. Strength can only come from God's word, and that is comfort. In Jude 5, Jude writes, say, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Jude verse 17, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stephen reminded the Jews of their history with God. And because he reminded them, they stoned him for it. People, God's people who say they want the truth, will always give you a good faith. But when the truth starts hitting close to home, Isaiah's ministry, I like to, let's look at what I'd like to say, what is, is his trial sermon. You know, that first one he spoke in Isaiah chapter 1. Let's look at the language here. In Isaiah chapter 1, starting at verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uriah, Jonathan, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people does not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backwards. Why? Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the top of the head, there is no soundness in it. But the wound, but wounds and bruises, and purifying sores, they have not been clothed, neither bound up, neither modified, modified with ornament. It's a harsh, harsh statement about people. Hard-headed, the whole body sick. I mean, from head to toe, just as simple. Now, if he was trying to get a, 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 a job today in the average kind of, kind of day, he wouldn't get that. Because, you know, people like to hear smooth things. Don't tell us the truth about ourselves. Lie to us. We are, we are comfortable with that. Tell us some lies, and we'll give you a big salary. <laughs> and that's what we preach for, money and prestige. Earth made level symbolizes the flawlessness of the Lord's coming. In verse 4 of Isaiah chapter 40. Salvation, a man-made complication. I want you to understand something. Salvation is complicated not by God. It's complicated by us. Because there's some things. And, 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 and let me share this with you right quick. 
I like what Jesus said over in the book of Matthew as well as Luke. But Jesus made a statement that we still have a problem with today. Jesus said, if any man follow me, let him first deny himself. That is, empty self of self. That is, pride. And we have a lot of that which is tearing the brotherhood asunder. Pride will not allow many people to acknowledge that they have done wrong. Why is it so hard to repent? Well, somebody's going to know I'm capable of making a mistake. But we are all flawed vessels. Every one of us. Salvation, again, a, a man-made complication. God's simplicity. But by man's terminology to date, humiliation is a bad word. And what humiliation is? It's simply the state of being humble. We have a problem with being truly humble to God's word. Simply put, all we've got to do is allow God's word to reign supreme. And whenever we make a mistake, God's word is the one that straightens us up. Not any one of us, but God would. And, 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 and let me share something with them. But y'all know that already. When an individual fails to hear, hear God's word, what makes you think he's going to listen to you? If he's not paying attention to the scriptures, he's putting a twist on everything, then he's definitely not going to listen to you. Salvation has always been a matter of man simply submitting, that is, humbling his, his will and doing God's will. Thus, all we got to do is stop trying to help God out and allow God to work in our life. Eve thought she could help Adam. How she, how she thought she could help? She taught him how to follow. Sarah thought she could help God out by God promised her promised a son, but she was up in age, so she thought she'd help God out. Now, you know the problem we got with her helping, helping God out. Ishmael, the, he's the father of the Arabs now. Let me share something. All we've got to do, and that's what Isaiah is telling us, is learn to wait on God. We want everything in our own time. Learn to wait on God. Lot's daughters thought they could help him out because they figured mankind was, was through. You see what happened there. See, when we start injecting our own intellect into God's plan, we, 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 we run afoul. Salvation was in the mind of God from the very foundation of the world. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 35. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34. Luke chapter 11 verse 50. John chapter 17 and verse 24. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 3. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 17 and verse... 13 and 8, excuse me. All these references. My God does not make a mistake. Salvation was in the mind of God from the foundation of the world. All we have to do, friends, is stay focused and allow God's word to lead us. Now, in my lesson, if you just want to read the lesson, it's, it's in the book. But there are some matters that we in the brotherhood have to start dealing with from a very... And, and I appreciate Brother Moore and, and, and the things that he said. And, and I appreciate... And, and, and it refreshes me because I'm one of those preachers that when I make a mistake, I stand in front of the congregation and acknowledge it. Preachers have gotten too large where they can't acknowledge a shortcoming. Now, a major problem here in the brotherhood is that Dave Miller, that once was a sound brother, he didn't sin. He had a lapse in judgment. Now, friends, I'm not I, I'm not that educated, okay? But honestly, now if I go outside, my car is parked over here to my left. But if I go outside and make a a, a right turn, that was a lapse of judgment. But did I sin? Sin is transgression of God's law. When we do something that you cannot verify from God's word, it is sin. You can nickname it all you want. You can do cosmetic surgery to it. It is sin. Our problem is we don't want to acknowledge that we have sin. Not, not, not. And, and I call names, so uh, like, and, 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 and I appreciate you, brother Hatch. But like I said, a lot of times they don't call me back because I call names. And, and but the, but my scripture tells me to warn. And 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 and. and, and, and the beautiful thing I, I like about God's word, God said, go and teach him. After baptizing, teach him some more. He didn't say make him. He said, teach him. 
So all we've got to do is teach God's word. Stand on God's word. When they fail to heed God's word, they didn't fail you or I, they failed God. And I want you to understand something. I don't care how much education you got. And I'm not knocking education because my wife is an educated woman. But when you put your education above God, and, and, I, and you can go to all the universities in the world. I, I appreciate those men smarter than me. But I want you to understand something. You don't impress God with your degrees. You don't impress God with who you are. We impress God by being humble and obedient to his word. And, I, and the problem with the brotherhood, we are not being humble. Every one of you here, and you know, and you know, a, a child, let that be illustration. I, I got a two-year-old. He, he's learning to talk. So, but let's say a four-year-old who pretty much has grasped the English language and talk to. And you teach that young child what sin is. Well, smoking is a sin. But that that child, when they see Uncle Joe come in there smoking, he says, Uncle Joe, you sinning. He didn't think about the politics in the matter. He just, he's like, nah. and that's what we've got to do. We've got to be that simple. we got to be just that simple. we got to point sin out when, and you know what? Leave it be. Because you know, one thing I, I, what Jesus said over there in, in the book of Matthew, around chapter 10, he said, sometimes for those in your household, will be your own food. But, when you take the gospel to someone, you are not the power behind God's word. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 tells me that God is the power behind his word. When we go and bring the gospel, we go there expecting them to obey. Well, when they don't obey, then we're disappointed. But friend, they did. And, and, and same thing Samuel had to deal with. Samuel said, well, uh, God, uh, they reject me. God said, no, they didn't reject you. They rejected me. But give them what they want. They want a king. And God told them what that king was, what, 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 what's going to be the consequence of it. So why are we crying now? We knew what the king was going to do. He hadn't stopped. He, he invented our children. He taxed our land. Let me get back to the lesson. God knew when it was time to implement the last phase of his scheme of redemption. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 tells us say that, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Verse 5 of Isaiah chapter 40, Christ would be, would be revealed to all flesh, that is Jews and Gentiles, and we can find the verification in, excuse me, in John chapter 1 verses 14 through 18. And Isaiah chapter 40, Verses 6 to 8. See, man cannot change the fact that he is flesh, withering as grass, but God's word lasts forever. Surely, Hezekiah's beginning as king had to come to mind, at least as for, in, in, in some of the minds of the, of the Judeans. In First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 3, the scripture affirms that Hezekiah had a zeal that as soon as he was able, up under, from up under his father, he went out and tore down all those groves that his father had erected to false idols. See, it gets back to individual responsibility and individual action. We know what everybody else is doing wrong. You can't correct what they're doing, but you can't correct what you're doing. We've got to do the right thing. And if enough people do the right thing, The fact that Isaiah showed no fear as he dealt with Hezekiah's father Ahab for 16 years had to have an indulgible impression upon young Hezekiah. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse following. Zion, that is Jerusalem, was to announce the coming of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 9 through 11. Because the word forever, because the word lasts forever, it should be publicized, spread, and not unlike the day, the people suffered from chronic selective amnesia. And, 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 and I say that very, very adamantly. Every one of the brothers that are causing the problems in the brotherhood today know the truth. Better than you. So when you go there and tell them about their wrong, you're expecting them to change? They're not listening to God? How are they going to listen to you? But, but you know what? But it's still, and, and, and you know, because people don't listen, doesn't negate our responsibility of going out there and still telling them what does say the Lord. 
Not, 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 not again. Remember, Stephen got killed for telling the truth. He got stoned to death. So you think you're going to get into better treatment? You think they're going to they're gonna talk good about you in, 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 in their periodicals? They, they're going to welcome you in with open arms? I mean, they're going to really lay out the carpet for you? Come on now. Now, what, what, that, what, what that is, that, the water they do when they clean the hog, what they call it? Hogwash. What is good for? Throw it out. If you are expecting accolades from man, especially when you're dealing with the truth, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But there's a slim chance. When you take the truth, someone may listen. Someone may listen. And what we as preachers must do, don't get caught up. And, and I, I'm glad that, that preachers aren't like used car sales because used car sales got to have a quota every month. Uh, uh, you know, all we are told to do is preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exalt with all long suffering, but most importantly, we do it with doctrine. The voice of hope is a useless voice if it does not speak. Hope can only be found in God's Word. Evangelism. For 16 years, Ahab worshiped and served not the God of heaven, but Mocha, the God of the Ammon for whom Solomon built a shrine, Ahaz must have been the first Jewish king to offer the gruesome and appalling custom of burning children alive. Uh, Cross-reference that with 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 27. The prophet had accepted into the death of his spirit God's announcement that the true spoiler, that is the rod of his anger and the staff of his indignation is not Assyria but Babylon. He has accepted the sentence that his people is to go into captivity. Now, let me, let me share something with you. The same thing that Isaiah had to deal with a hard-head people that, who were stuck on their ways, they were stuck in their sin. What can you tell them to bring them out of sin other than God's word? Nothing. You can continue to preach the truth, and we've got to do like Isaiah. You cannot look at the immediate. Keep preaching the truth, but look towards the future. Look to the coming kingdom of God. And that's what Isaiah was telling the people. The kingdom is coming. You are so mired down in, in, in your depravities now. Captivity must come. But look to the future. There's going to be a remnant for coming. Now I want you to understand something. No one can pair, compare with my God. No one. According to Isaiah chapter 40 verses 12 through 14. God is beyond human measure and human counsel. Our mind, our finite mind, cannot begin to grasp the infinite, infinity that is God. I mean, there's the awesome the fact that he created the world. And we're still trying to explain that way. No man can successfully tell God to do anything. And you know what I like about Job? Job, Job had some problems. I mean, Job, he, he was struck down for being righteous, but... Job, Job got, in, 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 in his agony, Job asked a question of God. In around chapters 42, uh, 41, 42, God asked Job a question. And Job showed us the sense to shut up. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to shut up and let God handle his business. All we've got to do is teach God's word. We are not the power behind his word. Just continue to do what does say the Lord. There's going to be brothers and sisters that go astray. And, 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 and over here in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Spirit speaketh expressly. Why? Is it any, any, any wonder that I've I, I seen in, in the paper that where Curtis Cake wrote something about, uh, and it was a good article, real good article, but his own words shoot him in the foot. Let me tell you. What can you go tell this man that he don't already know? The brotherhood has decided that they're going to be factuous. And you know what? There's nothing you can do to change that. Only God will change that. But we got man-made innovations like hand clapping. Uh, and you can marry for any other kind of reason that you want. I've had to deal with a preacher over there not long ago. We got, uh, I know many of y'all have heard of uh, Jack Evans. He's a resident uh, expert. He's all on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. 
He's coming to uh, Bishopville, South Carolina, and Sap said, I'm going over there and deal with him, brother, but he's in uh, Memphis camp right now. So I had to ask him, and, and wasn't being honest, uh, wasn't being uh, hateful, but I said, how long do you think that you can continue in your way before someone else pick it up and then you be upset with him? You think you're the only one that can be in error? But yet when someone else comes and they're in error too, you're going to go and confront them? That just doesn't make any sense, friend. The scriptures say that we must adhere to God's word. And our biggest problem is we're trying, we're trying to make, we still haven't gotten away from that concept that's over there in Genesis chapter 11. That Tower of Babel, or Babel, or whatever you want to pronounce it. Too many of us are still trying to make a name for ourselves. We are dragging the Lord's name through the mud, muck and mire, and we think we are lifting up our name? That's foolishness. That is foolishness. God will have the glory. And I love what over there in Zechariah uh, chapter 2, God said, I'll be their follower. Say, I'll be the glory. God will be the glory. And I want you to understand something, friend. Every one of us, we're going to answer to that same God. We're going to answer to the same word. You can go there and, 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 and try to be as humble as you want in front of God. But I, I like what what, what, what over in Genesis chapter 3, but all the excuses God accepted is it's delineated. When he asked Adam, why did he did what he did? What he did? Now you know he knew. God knew already. When he asked Eve, you know he knew. He was giving us a chance to be responsible. And that's all God wants for us to be responsible and accountable. We are going to make some mistakes. But the thing that our loving God will allow, He will allow us to repent. He will allow us to turn. Now, He will allow us to repent. But I want you to understand something. Repentance does not negate a bad crop yield. And when I, what I say about that, whatever you have sown, you shall reap. But God will forgive. And I, if you think I've been all over the place, I feel I have. Because a lot of things I wanted to try to share with you. And, I, and like I said, if you, want to see what was, if you wanted me to repeat what was in the book, I could have got the book and read it to you word, word for word, and, and we'd have had it all right there. But that's not, that's not who I am. I'm the individual that the churches in the CSRA withdrew from because I preached against evangelistic oversight. I preached against uh, the erroneous view of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I preached against hand clapping in the service. I pre all those innovations that man has brought in. Like I say, salvation is complicated simply by our endeavors. All we've got to do is stand and stay focused on God's word. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak God's word to you. But I want you to understand something. And we going I know I, my time running out. I never did watch watch clock. I got a watch on my hand. You know, I, I never do watch the clock. Let's look at Isaiah chapter forty right quick. And I remember I remind my congregation we don't have a clock uh, in the, in the in the assembly hall because it had to, it had to be it would have to be where that clock is at the back, right? And you know what? If any of y'all had to see it, you had to turn around and look at it. Remember last wife in Acts chapter forty and verse one. This is the key to it. But they that wait upon the Lord. We can stop right there. Our problem is we don't know how to wait. We've got to wait on the Lord. God's word said this is what we must do. And as long as we adhere to God's word, then God's going to be pleased with it. Those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And friends, I, I, I got it in my book. They just read about the things about running and about fainting. But I like what Paul said over there, and I'll end with it, in, in Galatians uh, chapter 6, around verse 6 and 7 and 5. What about 6? He said, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sowed to the flesh, he shall of the flesh reap corruption. If he sowed to the spirit, he shall reap life after life everlasting. But we shall reap in due season if we faint not. Friends, we just got to stay focused with God. And as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Not whether you think they deserve it or not. But the Bible says we're to do good because God commands us to do the right thing. 
And as long as we're doing what does say the Lord, man ain't going to throw all the bricks in the world at you. But man don't have a heaven or a hell to put you in. You stay focused with God, learn to wait on God, and that is wait on His Word. Allow God's Word to be the leading focus in your life. Don't focus on your neighbor because he'll fail you. And that's what Isaiah is telling you about. Let us stay focused and wait on God. Now, we understand that waiting in, in, in the Bible doesn't mean sitting down like most people think they can come to church and just sit there and don't do that. The church is not a spectator sport. It's participatory. When you come in, you've got to get busy for the Lord. You've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And my time, I, I know it's up. I appreciate and love each and every one of you. And if, you ne if we never see each other again, this is one individual that's saying, I'm trying to do what does say the Lord. But if you ever see me out there, don't be like someone say, well, I think there was brother so-and-so. Come to me. Come to me. And see, that's what we got to do to one another. And I appreciate what Brother Morris said over there. He drove 300 miles to discuss with a brother. And that was, look, and I want you to understand something. I know it wasn't because he was mad with it. It's because he loved it. And love got to be the motivating factor, friend. Thank you so much. Sherman, we pray.